I'm Helen Boucher from Tufts Medical Center here in Boston, and um, I am honored to be um, chairing this uh, panel session for the next uh, 45 minutes or so with some really outstanding colleagues. So we have um, Dr. Natasha Hochberg from Boston University, uh, Dr. Manos Paris from Entesis Pharmaceuticals, and Dr. For, uh, Dr. Chris um, Loker um, from Veristop, all experts uh, in various areas of science that are affecting the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're going to cover um, a range of topics and then do our best to answer uh, as many questions as we can um, for you while we're here. I think I'll just start by saying that I think most of you know that the epidemic is here. It's arrived. We're caring for patients actively in our hospitals, uh, including those who are critically ill with the COVID-19 virus. So as we start um, this 26th day of March, um, I think it's a good time to just reemphasize the need to double down on social distancing measures and all the things that are causing hardship in our lives right now. And we'll talk you know, more about that as we go through the hour. So maybe I'll just kick us off. Um, and one of the first topics that we were asked to address is how does this current virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and the way it infects differ from past um, coronaviruses that we've dealt with, like MERS and SARS? Uh, and maybe, Chris, do you want to kick that off for us? Chris, I think you're, you need to unmute. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Thanks. Sure. You're welcome. Um, so there's about 40 members of coronaviruses, um, seven of which are known to infect people, two of which are known to cause the common cold. They're well known in veterinary sciences infecting cows, chickens, and pigs. Um, the beta coronaviruses infect bats, and that's the origin currently of MERS, SARS, and um, SARS-2 or COVID-19. Um, SARS-1 and SARS-2 are the most closely related viruses. They're about 85% identical. They all originated in bats. There's been some reports that the pandolin, the spiny anteater, is an intermediate host. Um, but um, that is not proven and uh, is causing transmission in people. It's thought it went from bats to people and then from people to people for the current COVID-19 outbreak, primarily originating in the Wuhan um, food market, live food market. But in terms of the number of in infections, it's not as um, uh, virulent as MERS was. MERS was much more virulent and killed more people, had a, um, a higher death rate but the, uh, the MERS, the COVID uh, SARS-1 was actually a little bit less virulent than the current COVID-19 epidemic. So there are variations. Um, there is overlap with their sequences. It may be possible to have a cross-strain vaccine eventually, um, but currently it's undergoing antigenic drift and there's current um, reports of antigenic shift. So I'll stop there. Great, thanks, Chris. Any other uh, other panelists? Anything to add? Um, just just one one point, Helen. And I I do hope that uh, you can hear me clearly. Um, the the way in, in which the uh, uh, SARS CoV CoV two uh, seems to transmit is uh, to produce is is actually similar to influenza in that uh, the viral load and and shedding. Uh, is at its peak when symptoms um, occur, when symptoms begin. Uh, in the case of SARS-1, the original SARS, um, there, there was uh, fever and other symptoms before the peak occurred. So you could contain it much more easily through uh, scanning for fever uh, or isolating symptomatic patients. That does not appear, be a, it appear to be the case for uh, the virus that causes COVID-19, uh, and that makes it much harder to contain. Yeah, great point, Manos, um, and that is part of uh, some of what's plagued us so far in managing this epidemic, the, the fact that there is asymptomatic transmission and the lack of testing that we've had available to us. And maybe that's a good way to transition over to Natasha uh, to see if you might enlighten us about uh, incubation, transmission, uh, and recovery periods for this virus, as well as 
um, maybe comment on the virus's ability to live on surfaces, which has been a very hot topic the past few days in the news. Try this way. Can you hear me? Hear you now, Can Natasha. You hear me? Um, we can hear you. Can, can you know what? You're cutting in and out again. Sorry, hello. You seem to be having a little bit of Zoom, Zoom issues. Natasha, maybe you want to try your phone. Uh, can the other panelists yeah, still I'm hear me? Okay. Okay. Well, I'll just go ahead for a minute and talk a little bit about uh, the incubation period for this virus. It's a 14-day incubation period, um, and that is the reason why we quarantine uh, exposed people for 14 days. Um, and uh, the transmission is by droplets, so it's coughing and sneezing. And we know that the usual distance that we that our droplets can be um, transmitted is three feet, maybe up to five feet. That's why we consider a contact being within six feet of someone for more than 15 minutes um, who has the virus. In terms of recovery, the recovery for this virus is somewhat variable. It's usually on the order of two weeks, but for people who are, um, people who are uh, sick uh, and critically ill, it can be much longer. There was a study that came out this week uh, that said it went out to 21 days. Natasha, do we have you back yet? Um, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes. Welcome back. You can hear me. You can hear me. Okay, we're going to try this way. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so you can still hear me, Helen? Yes, we got you. <laughs> okay. My apologies. I'm trying on the phone. I'm trying on the computer. So it's the ultimate multitasking. My apologies. Um, so I got most of what said. Um, were there outstanding questions that you have me, I apologize. No problem. So uh, maybe you can comment on the virus's ability to live on surfaces um, and some of these questions that have been in the news the past few days about people's clothes and uh, some of those areas. Sure. So there have been studies to come out looking at how long the virus will last on surfaces. And so these sort of experimental models and what they've found is that, for example, with cardboard, it looks like it'll last for about 24 hours, potentially a little longer, um, with some um, plastic on the order of 48 hours, some metals on the order of 72 hours. So you know, I think that you see it can last on material and that does have important implications. I think the, the key point home, though, is that this is all about hand washing um, and sort of wiping down surfaces. As for the issue of sort of shoes and whether it's going to be on shoes, if we remember, this is really primarily droplets from one individual to another. So, um, you know, you can imagine they're coughing directly on your shoes, which is a little less likely. I think the real thing is sort of any surface that you're going to touch with your hands and then potentially touch with your face. Your face. That's great. Thanks, Natasha. And the whole, it's a mucous membrane virus, so you got to touch, it, it's, that's why we really want to avoid touching our face. Um, excellent. So, um, Manos, how do you see this epidemic affecting academia and industry and the focus, uh, uh, focus on and investment in research and development for other infectious diseases? Thanks for the question, Helen, and, and um, um, I, I do hope you, you can hear me. Beautifully, thanks. Okay, excellent. Um, look, in the short term, uh, it's not going to be good. Uh, just walk around Kennel Square and, and you'll see empty streets. The, um, uh, most of uh, the companies like ours um, have scaled down uh, on their lab work. Uh, it's important that we protect our scientists and our employees. Uh, so in the short term, it's, it's not going to be good. Things are going to be slower. Uh, I do think that uh, it does teach us something about resilience and vulnerability. Uh, it is perhaps tempting, given the progress that we've made as an industry uh, in the last decades, to feel that 
nothing is out of reach that we cure all disease or pretty much all disease and uh, we're working on the few remaining uh, but clearly that's not the case nature is uh, providing us with a painful reminder of that um, and speaking of resiliency I would like to say a few words about infectious diseases because this is a space that unfortunately um, a, a number of companies uh, um, have exited. Uh, this is a space where uh, Big Pharma was investing heavily uh, two or three decades ago, and, and, and today you find mostly small biotechs like ours investing. Uh, and a resilient system is one where companies like ours, um, who have, have the people and capabilities to um, uh, invest in, um, uh, in, in curing uh, infectious diseases, um, uh, have the resources uh, to do so uh, beyond the day-to-day -day running. Uh, if you, you will have seen that uh, perhaps antibiotics are, are out of favor as a space, that's because antibiotics are not as profitable as other therapeutic carriers. In fact, they're not profitable at all. Uh, a number of companies launching are going out of money. Uh, and when a crisis like COVID-19 occurs, it's important that we have scientists and companies um, who can turn their hand to that uh, and, and contain the epidemic. That, that's what resilience and preparedness mean. Uh, and I think uh, in the long run, uh, we, it's teaching us that, that we need to be ready. We need to be ready for, uh, for the unexpected. Great. Thanks, Manos. Chris, anything yeah. to add? Um, hopefully, this will be a wake-up call for various um, pharmaceutical companies, especially big pharma. As a small pharma company, we often get feedback saying, who's your pharma partner? Uh, we want to mitigate the risk for your program. We want to be able to be sure that you can pass the torch when you want to commercialize your product. Um, as you know, infectious diseases, there's few and far between uh, large pharma companies uh, that are currently potential partners. So it really limits the, the universe of people that are willing to take this on. Um, on the other hand, companies like uh, Gilead have done very well with infectious disease, certainly with small molecules. Uh, they've been, uh, for example, testing two phase three trials of remdesivir. So um, there are companies out there that are, are taking the lead, um, but hopefully this will help shift the tide from engagement of large pharma industry to reach out to smaller biotech companies and um, we can be better prepared when the next pandemic hits. Yeah, great point, Chris. Um, Manos, do you want to comment about the effects of this epidemic and the uh, issues that have arisen on research and development in other therapeutic areas? Well, I think uh, I, I think that the, um, um, the the effect, as I as I mentioned. Uh, it's probably going to be uh, a net positive in the long run. Uh, I think uh, it's bringing to the fore the, the need for investment in R&D, uh, the need for investment, continued investment in new technologies. Some of the, uh, um, some of the vaccines that are, uh, for instance, some of the vaccines and therapeutics even that, that are, are being developed uh, on the fast track for COVID-19 right now, are technologies that didn't exist a decade ago, uh, and uh, they were of course not developed for COVID-19 because that didn't exist at the time. Uh, but but these are technologies that that could get us a therapeutic or a vaccine uh, at unprecedented speed. So I think it speaks to the need for continued investment, both in academia and in industry, on developing new technologies and and and, and new therapeutics. Um, taking it back perhaps to to infectious diseases, Helen, and that's something I should have mentioned earlier, um, the, um, a number of patients who are infected by uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, actually um, acquire secondary infections, uh, and uh, those secondary infections are often bacterial or fungal, uh, and uh, as well as not having therapeutics for uh, COVID-19 right now, um, we are out of good therapies for other uh, infectious pathogens. and. Um, that I think is, uh, is is also going to be a wake up call. Uh, saving a patient from uh, SARS CoV 2 only to see them um, suffer or die from a, an infection by a drug resistant pseudomonas or a semitobacter uh, is, uh, uh, is, is, is quite, quite disappointing and, and dramatic, actually. So um, I think there's going to be uh, a, um, a resurgence, hopefully. Uh, increase in investment in R&D, in pharmaceutical R&D in the years to come uh, as we understand the value of that um, being, being perhaps beyond what we've taken for granted in the last few years. 
Yeah, great point, Manos. And we, we have a lot to learn about secondary bacterial infections in this disease. Early reports from Wuhan suggested a 10% um, incidence of secondary bacterial infections, but a more recent report that came out last week from ZHO, ZHOU and colleagues in The Lancet um, showed a 55.0% uh, incidence of secondary bacterial infections among those who died from this disease. So it may be that uh, secondary bacterial infections are important here as they are in influenza. Much to learn and certainly a reason uh, for continued focus on innovation uh, in antibiotic research and development. Um, just want to encourage people, it looks like a lot of people are already um, entering their questions in the Q&A tab. Uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can. And maybe I will um, send this one back to Natasha. More questions about um, surfaces and what about uh, the data that this virus lives on cardboard, plastics, et cetera. Uh, is it transmittable that way? Can we get this from picking up our mail? So I think that we don't necessarily have all the data to support that. We know that there's viable virus on there, but there aren't necessarily data to show us the likelihood of transmission in that, in that setting. So um, you know, I think at this point, it's better to be safe about it. Um, I, I would back up, though, to, a com to the discussion that we were just having. There's this interesting concept that I, um, I was told that the, the, the Chinese character for crisis is actually made up of two characters, and one is danger, and one is opportunity. And so I think we all see the real and present danger right now, but I think that there's also incredible opportunity, particularly for individuals in this community, to address some of the gaps that we have. And um, I think we can all talk more about that, but I think that it's incumbent on us to address the key scientific questions and also to emphasize the importance of maintaining our sort of public health infrastructure. Because I think that we've seen the repercussions when um, when there's not enough support for that, and so I think as sort of a, um, a biologically inclined group, then it's um, you know it's our responsibility to ensure that the infrastructure is maintained for the future. So just a thought. Great, thanks so much. And if I can just encourage people to use the Q and A box, that'll help us not to miss any of your questions. So I'll take this next one was about where did you get the 15 minutes. Uh, for what we consider a contact. So CDC defines contact to an infected individual as being within six feet of someone for 15 minutes or more when that person is not wearing a mask so that the mask part is only relevant to us in the hospital. But um, that is what they consider based on uh, data about the spread of other uh, respiratory droplet viruses the time of when you would incur a significant risk of exposure. So that's direct CDC data. Um, let's see. Um, this one could go maybe to Chris or Mono. Let's start with Chris. Should companies be planning for a return to normalcy, or do you expect that this will be the new normal for now? Things like summer company parties or all company meetings, are they gone for good? Um, I doubt it. I think that uh, based on the trends that we've seen epidemiologically around the world is that the curve will flatten eventually. It usually takes a uh, better part of a month before uh, we start seeing that when people are quarantined. And um, I do hope that that will be the case certainly here in the United States. We, we do need to get back to normal. And as you know, we, we can't live like this uh, on a, having repeated pandemics where people have to stay quarantined uh, for more than a month at a go. Great, thank and you. Oh, I, I would agree. Uh, if, if, I, if I may add, I think um, when, when that uh, normality might, might, might return is, is almost a moot point. I think in reality, no one, no one can predict uh, one, one can hope that this, uh, this will disappear or, uh, or become endemic and seasonal and, and, and certainly less lethal. But the important thing is as we, um, as we take precautions uh, and, and we put measures in place to limit the spread, we do so with a long term in mind. And I'll tell you what we've done with our colleagues at Entesis. Um, we sat down and, and, and we thought, what, what is this going to look like if we're at the same place come September? I don't want to be alarmist. I'm not saying that this will go through um, uh, through into September, but um, whatever we put in place now needs to be sustainable beyond the next couple of weeks uh, or even three, uh, because quite frankly, you can't predict that it's going to be over in three weeks, and something that might be sustainable in the short term um, might be harder to keep in the long run uh, and 
um, taking a guard down uh, after a couple of weeks when the epidemic is still here uh, is probably the worst thing that we can do if we want to limit the spread. Yeah, and I would just build on that. Um, there are data to show out of China that, you know, we think about this in terms of the R naught or how many people an infected individual is going to infect. And so they're modeling data from China to show that this was about 2.4 before all of the um, restrictions were put in place, but it required very strict restrictions in terms of travel to drop that the effective, um, the number of people that would be infected. So that dropped to around one when they were able to put in these severe restrictions. So I think um, it, it's a little bit difficult to extrapolate from the China data because we're operating under a different system and our level of restrictions is different. So I agree there's no crystal ball that we have to take into account the measures that we're putting into place when we think about how quickly we can actually uh, control them. That's great. That addresses a couple of questions. I think um, we all agree that it's impossible to know uh, exactly when we'll be up and running and, and whether that would meet the president's um, stated goal of Easter. Um, Natasha, let me ask you a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, there have been rumors that the virus cannot live in warmer temperatures. Um, there was another one, is the virus less stable outdoors due to UV light? Um, you want to comment on those? Sure. So there's always been this hope that when the warmer um, temperatures come up, um, particularly um, in our hemisphere, that we'll see a drop in the virus. That's still possible, although as you're seeing in some warmer climates now, we still see a lot of circulating virus. That's probably, um, this gets a little complicated, but that's probably the fact that there's very little herd immunity. There's very few immune people in any of these populations. So even the effect of humidity and temperature can't really help us out that much yet. The hope is that in the future, it potentially could. As for UV, um, there are some data now about um, sort of UV um, particularly being used to actually irradiate um, masks um, that have been used and that um, uh, different sort of amounts of UV can um, kill the virus. So um, whether that, how that equates to sort of leaving things outside and the amount of UV radiation, um, actually, I'm not sure if Helen you want to comment on that. Sorry, you cut out there at the end, Natasha. Sorry, I was just saying that um, there are data to show in labs that you can use UV irradiation to irradiate masks that have been used in healthcare workers. And in fact, a lot of hospitals are gonna now start using UV irradiation to irradiate the masks because we're running so short on masks. Um, but whether that's gonna to apply to sort of um, natural UV radiation, I'm not sure of the data behind that. A great point. So I would agree. The group at Nebraska was um, highlighted, I think, in the New York Times within the last week for their work on the UV radiation um, to, uh, you know, sanitize N95 masks for reuse. So that's a, an area of intensive study and, and it's something that many people have been kind of forced to do because of the severe shortages of PPE that we all have, uh, personal protective equipment, that is. So um, we're very hopeful that that's going to be successful, and there are a number of areas in, of investigation along those lines. But as Natasha points out, we don't know if, if daily sunlight uh, has that effect or not. Um, okay, we've had a number of questions around diagnostic testing, and this, of course, has been the Achilles heel of this epidemic. Um, so maybe, Chris, we would ask you to talk a little bit about what's known um, about uh, diagnostic testing, the current sensitivity uh, of our tests, and uh, what kind of considerations we should be having? Um, well, I think it's important to have the right controls when you run the tests. Certainly, there's been a lack of availability. It's great that companies are stepping up to the plate and providing diagnostic kits. I know they're working 24-7 to make this a reality so that we have the tests available. Unfortunately, we didn't jump ahead of the curve fast enough, and uh, there's been some hiccups along the way. As they say, science happens. So unfortunately, um, we're a little late to the party, if you will, with our diagnostic kits. But um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's a tough call. When people feel ill um, or they've been exposed, it's important that they get the test. But um, they have to be careful, too, about not to transmit the, the virus to other people. So self-quarantine and a sel sense of self-responsibility is really is what's going to keep a lid on this transmission, um, as well as testing, so we can isolate those that are infected. Great. And there's a follow-up question on whether we know if PCR is the most effective method for testing and detecting uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. Are other methods being developed? Yeah, there's antibody test methods that are being developed, but they're not approved. So far, the PCR method is the one that's currently approved. Just a Great. And I would just I add that clinically, that we have to learn, we're still learning about the sensitivity of the test and we have seen patients um, who have required more than one test, and so having a, a very high index of clinical suspicion um, in those patients who have an influenza-like illness for which we can't find another diagnosis is very, very important as we continue to learn about uh, the key things about the test. The other issue has come up is that there is a shortage of swabs to do the test, and that has led us to use some methods that may not be as optimal such as an oropharyngeal swab as opposed to a nasopharyngeal swab. Natasha, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, yeah sorry. I'm going to build on that. I think that issues, too, in terms of discordance between nasopharyngeal swabs versus lower respiratory samples, and that's also caused some problems. Um, and I want to also build on, too, of serologic testing because I think this is an area where um, this group is like involved in huge need um, the ultimately, in order to identify workers, of healthcare workers that kind of be able to go back to work, we need to know who's protected, at least in the short term. And so serologic testing is really going to be a show gap for us. So ramping that up will work. Yeah, very important that we have serology and that we have better capacity. Um, one of the things that New York has done is they've really advanced a lot in their testing capacity, which hopefully is going to help them. Okay, let's change gears a little bit. Um, there's a question here about, is it okay to use ibuprofen and other non-steroidals? There are some reports suggesting against its use when an individual is infected with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. So there is a, a biologic plausibility to this concern, but so far, um, at least my impression is that we don't have the data uh, to support either for or against um, non-steroidals having an effect I think some of us clinically have um, in individual patients advised using uh, acetaminophen preferentially because of the theoretical concern, but it is just that, a theoretical concern. Other panelists, anything to add? I agree. Great. Okay. Um, there's a question on airborne transmission. Uh, there have been some reports that the virus can be viable in the air for a few hours. Who would like to take that? So I can take that. There, there have been reports that, um, that it is viable in the air. That being said, we do not think that there are limited motive concerns. Again, we think it's really permanently droplets, which are short-lived in the air, and can rest on surfaces, so that's why this whole issue of um, the close contact within six feet of an individual is the most important when we think about transmission. Basically, widespread airborne transmission would be a very different um, pandemic, but our, um, for example, China's ability to sort of cut down on it, it relies on the fact that we know the predominant mode is droplet. Great. Okay, this one is for Chris or Manos, how are companies, um, perhaps you can speak just on your company, planning to adapt um, moving forward for future cases where people have to work from home for a long period of time? Would this also translate to allowing for a more flexible general policy regarding work from home? Um, this is Christopher, I, I would hope so. Um, we're certainly flexible currently with people working from home. Uh, we often have a lot of paperwork to do on our contracts and grants. So 
So um, I would encourage people to stay at home. We can certainly see a difference in the traffic being alleviated. So hopefully it'll encourage people to be more flexible and employers to be more flexible. I would echo that. Um, what we've done at uh, Entesis is uh, uh, obviously provide employees who can work from home with uh, uh, additional equipment, uh, keyboards, uh, screens, so that they don't have to uh, gouge their eyes out trying to look at the phone screen. Um, uh, but I was having a conversation with my colleagues a couple of days ago uh, after a week or so of working from home. Uh, and uh, there is something about having interactions face to face in person. Um, and, and working from home, even with Zoom, when it works, uh, cannot substitute for for the personal uh, interactions. And uh, things do go a little slower, even if we don't have the traffic to deal with on the commute. Uh, and, and, and of course, um, in, in our space, uh, we can do a lot from home, uh, but the labs and the clinics uh, require our employees to be present uh, and, and, and work with uh, uh, work with uh, uh, with biology and chemistry on, on a dis in our discovery labs, uh, work with volunteers and patients in our clinical trial sites, uh, and uh, that uh, unfortunately uh, cannot be done from home. And, and uh, I really hope that that the shutdown, uh, which is already impacting a number of projects, uh, both preclinical and clinical, uh, I, I really do hope that that we can manage through that, and that it's not going to take too long because things are. Uh, are being put on hold or slowing down for pretty much everyone, I think. Thanks very much. So here's a question on uh, immunology. Is there, are there ideas on why children don't seem to get symptoms typically? Is this due to some aspect of the immune system in children? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Um, sure. I've heard reports from physicians that there's been discussions that um, regulatory T cells are uh, in a different type of balance when you get older versus when you're younger, and that may account for the age difference in the pathogenesis of disease and the severe acute respiratory syndrome that you see in elderly people. Um, it may be related to uh, the regulatory T cell functions, such as those mediated by co-stimulatory molecules and uh, PD-1 uh, ligand as well. Great. Thanks very much. Very and, interesting. And also, the case that viral load, viral load appears to be higher um, in older, uh, uh, older patients, uh, and uh, the ACE, uh, ACE receptor, which is the, the surface receptor for uh, SARS-CoV-2, is uh, more highly expressed as we, as we grow older. So that might be another, uh, another plausible explanation, but I have not seen definitely negative proof of um, either the immune hypothesis or the co-receptor hypothesis. Great, thank you. We're, we're going to come back to the ACE receptor in a minute when we talk about therapy. Um, first, let's take this one. We've seen larger scale shutdowns in currently hard hit states such as New York, California, and now Massachusetts. States with lower volume currently have not implemented, implemented these efforts. Conversely, countries like Italy have instituted full country shutdowns, even with uneven caseload across regions. Do you think it would be prudent for the U.S. to extend these shutdowns nationally? Or do you think the current state-by-state -state policies will achieve the necessary containment? Natasha, would you like to take that? Sure. So you're not making me enter politics, are you here? So I think this is a really tricky question. I think that ultimately we know that hospitals are already getting overwhelmed as Helen started off. And we know that our resources are getting stretched extremely thin. And the only way we can try to address this is to flatten that curve and keep people out of hospitals and keep transition from, um, from happening. And so I think that, you know, it's a, a balance, though, because as we're hearing the panelists say, all work shut down. This has implications for companies. This has a lot of implications for um, most of patients who um, work on sort of a daily basis for um, lower paid individuals who losing these patients has massive implications. So in fact, Boston Medical Center, we're dealing with the fact that a lot of our patients are becoming homeless um, and as a result of this. And so it's a, it's a real challenge of how do you um, keep people fed and housed and yet stop transmission. So um, in the ideal world, we would keep everyone at home and shut things down until transition sort of stops, but 
um, but we have to balance it. Thanks very much. So here's a doozy. Since the virus is transmitted via mucous membranes, why are leading doctors saying it's totally fine to eat out, to eat takeout, even if the restaurant worker happens to have COVID-19 and happens to cough or sneeze on your food because your stomach acid will kill the virus, question mark? It's still entering your mouth, which is a mucous membrane. So I guess I'll say my response and we'll see what Natasha thinks. I think that um, in this era of trying to balance uh, all the risks and benefits of this shutdown and the economic impact on, on small businesses like restaurants, um, takeout is felt to be a safer, a more safe alternative. And, and I have heard some quote experts recommend microwaving the food that you get um, as another uh, way to potentially um, impact uh, contamination. But I don't know, Natasha, what your thoughts are on the takeout issue. Yeah, I think my bigger concern would probably be the actual sort of plastic container or the, um, you know, the, the bag that it's come in. Um, and so I think, um, you know, hopefully if the food is hot enough, then potentially you uh, might affect the sort of vi um, virus as well in the food. So um, I think I'd be more concerned about the sort of potential packaging. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so let's turn now uh, our attention to therapy. And you know, unfortunately, as we sit here, there is no approved therapy for um, COVID-19 disease. There are a number of investigational agents. Um, we here at Tufts are involved in the remdesivir studies, and we've, used, we've already used tocalizumab in a patient. Um, but everything is investigational. And so with that in mind, um, we have some questions uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, is being used, and it got a lot of press recently. Um, and so uh, the question is, uh, or the statement is, that hydroxychloroquine is now unavailable for lupus patients. What are we doing about that? Um, I can tell you that here at Tufts, we actually, when we set in our, our kind of restrictions around this drug at the beginning of the epidemic, we made a, a allocation of drug for our rheumatologic patients. But I don't know, Natasha, do you have other, other insights? I think this is a huge issue. I, I would just underscore the fact that we're really in a pretty terrible state. To, we have a lot of patients, they're getting sick extremely quickly and our hands are somewhat tied. Um, so, you know, there's not an easy answer. Um, and I think I allocate some, some amount of the drug for um, patients that otherwise need it is really important. Um, on the other hand, we're, um, we're really uh, waging a war here with a very limited arsenal. Yeah, and I'll also add that the, the data for hydroxychloroquine is really um, rather thin. There was one study from France by Roalt and colleagues uh, that has been, um, you know, criticized somewhat for the limitations in those conclusions. And then there was just a study, I think, that came out yesterday from the Chinese literature, though it's been translated into English, that showed no difference uh, in uh, PCR negativity on day seven in, um, between hydroxychloroquine and standard of care. Very small study, very small numbers, but uh, for a drug that causes QT prolongation uh, and a patient population who's at risk of cardiac complications, and with a virus that directly affects the heart in many cases, I think some reason for pause um, in, in uh, jumping too fast to that drug. Yeah. Um, I may add, Helen, um, I, I'm, I'm a chemist, so clearly uh, clinical data trumps everything. Um, in, in situations like the one that we face right now with, with COVID-19, it's, uh, it's tempting to try and find something fast, but I think it's important that we keep our scientist hats on and and look at the data, and, and you mentioned some clinical data. Um, there is preclinical data that um, uh, supports that hydroxychloroquine, actually chloroquine itself, uh, are fairly active against COVID-19 in a test tube in vitro. Uh, unfortunately, the concentrations at which th these, these molecules work against COVID-19 uh, are a fact, an order of magnitude higher uh, than those uh, in which they work against, um, against plasmodium, for instance, which is another pathogen that chloroquine is used for. Um, so I, I would love to see some clinical data. I would say that preclinical science is, is, is at, best, um, at best mixed uh, in, in whether this should work or should not work. Uh, 
uh, and, and to, the, to the question that was asked, uh, we know that hydroxychloroquine uh, um, helps lupus patients. We know that hydroxychloroquine works against malaria, and I think it's important that we continue to be able to treat the patients who actually can benefit from the drug, um, as well as provide some hope for those who might benefit from the drug, but where there is no scientific or clinical basis for, for, for that yet. Yeah, great, great point. And there are a number of other um, drugs and uh, biologics that are being studied, and there's a huge push nationally to um, stand up as many clinical trials as possible uh, so that we can learn as much as we can as quickly as we can in the face of this epidemic. Um, another question, uh, this time for Chris, uh, it's coming back to the virus. What evidence, if any, is there showing that the virus has mutated? Um, and if there is any, would we be concerned about that affecting the development of immunity? Um, yeah, there, there is evidence. Uh, there's been reports coming out that there is genetic drift where there's point mutations going along in different populations. Furthermore, there's reports, and it's been established, that coronaviruses undergo genetic shift where that's genetic reassortment. Um, that poses even a bigger problem for the emergence of new strains. So um, we're always going to have to stay ahead of the game, and hopefully we can come up with a pan-coronavirus vaccine that will co cover multiple strains or at least have a really rapid turnaround time where we can make vaccines in a, in a uh, rapid response manner when pandemics emerge. Um, but the bottom line is with the genetic mutation rates and what seems to be appearing around the world, um, this is a virus that's going to be with us for a while. Thank you. And so speaking of vaccines, um, what do you think is a realistic in terms of uh, the timeline before which we would see reasonable commercial supplies of a vaccine? And then, you know, what good will it do when we get it? Well, it's going to depend on the vaccine. It's going to have to be proven to be effective in patients. Um, I was told that it's going to take well over a year before vaccines are available for people. Um, part of that is the immunogenicity of vaccines. It, it takes a while for vaccines to become immunogenic. Um, there are folks that are making replicons, which are non-virulent variants of viruses that you can measure neutralizing antibodies or neutralization of the virus in people upon challenge. Now, they, they won't cause a, a full-on SARS-2 or COVID-19 infection, but they will replicate to a certain extent in the body. So in that way, it's, it's a domesticated strain that you can measure uh, specific immunity, either cellular or antibody-based. Um, but large populations are generally needed for vaccines, and those studies are going to take a while. Now, granted, the FDA and the EMA have certainly uh, lightened up a lot of the restrictions. There's companies rushing to get uh, phase one data as soon as possible for multiple vaccine candidates. Uh, the World Health Organization just uh, published a report where there's 40 uh, vaccines in development, two of which are in the clinic. Uh, one of them is in China uh, with, this, with the Chinese CDC, and um, the other is the Moderna vaccine. So even with those vaccines um, being tested now uh, in people, it'll take at least a year before the immunogenicity data is, is read, and we know that those vaccines are safe. And hopefully we'll have some, some sense of challenge data as well in the near future to show efficacy. But everyone's on board. We need to make a vaccine as fast as possible. Um, the response has been faster than ever in the history of the world. So I think the scientific community really should be applauded for their cooperation and their ability to share data and making it available for folks to uh, advance the technology as soon as possible. Great, thanks. And maybe we'll follow up with a little more on the immunity front. So one question is, are patients who recover immune from getting this virus a second time? And then there was one other one um, asking about if we have any informative data yet on the development of immunity and whether or not uh, we could test for that and then kind of send people back to work. And in our world, there has been already discussion of preferentially assigning people who are, have lived through the infection to work on the front lines. So thoughts about that? So there are some data from SARS-1 about the development of immunity. And so I think we can um, hope that that plays a role. I think we still don't know that exactly in terms of this virus. 
um, there have been studies looking at the serologic response and the development of both IgM, IgG, and IgA over time, but we don't know particularly whether that's protective immunity. Um, but I think the, the hope is that we can take the data from SARS-1 and use that to extrapolate to SARS-2. I know there's a lot of work right now to identify sort of correlates of protective immunity um, and neutralizing antibodies, but at this point, um, we can hope that at least there's um, some duration of immunity and how long that lasts, we're not sure yet. Great, thanks. So we have a couple of more um, testing questions and you know, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but I thought it would be worth coming back to it. A couple of people asked about these test kits, including the one that was uh, cleared by the FDA last weekend. And the question is, you know, how reliable are they likely to be? and how much of an impact are they likely to have um, on you know, halting the spread of the epidemic. So these include tests that could give a result in 45 minutes as opposed to you know, eight to 12 hours. Um, thoughts, Manos, do you have any thoughts on that? Unfortunately not, Helen, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with, uh, uh, with the testing technologies. Perhaps Chris has a, a better handle on that. Um, sure. So it's, it's been shown that the test kits are actually imperative for controlling disease. That's been shown in South Korea. Um, they were able to identify and isolate subjects that tested positive for coronavirus. The fact that the FDA approved it um, is actually a, a pretty rigorous standard. Um, I wouldn't, they don't do things flippantly. Uh, they carefully analyze the data and uh, they've been working very hard to get things approved. So I think um, potentially it has a huge impact on the disease uh, in terms of identifying you know, positive cases and then isolating them and their immediate contacts uh, because that, that will help break the chain of transmission that is urgently needed currently. Just to build off of that, this is the, the rapid test is uh, building off the um, Cepheid platform. And so um, Cepheid has also done the sort of gene expert testing for TB diagnostics as well. Um, so that the platform is established. And I think that's sort of helpful because it's available in a lot of hospitals um, in, in many areas of the world. Great. Thank you. Um, so a couple of questions about getting back to normal, and I think um, one thing I'm happy to report from the front lines is that part of our disaster plan actually does include um, a recovery, a plan for recovery, so it's, it is helping to keep us hopeful that we have recovery on the horizon. Um, and the question is, once we return to work, would you recommend any changes in practices like avoiding large group meetings, continued higher levels of cleaning, uh, and then kind of a follow-up, I think these are both going to be for Natasha. Um, what, once we go back to normal, what's the likelihood that the COVID virus will return um, when it gets cold again next year? Well, I'm going to take the second one first because I think this is, this is really the, the question that's out there. This is the sort of million dollar question. What's going to happen once we, if we can get this under control um, and then we reopen sort of society, what's going to happen? And I think um, you know, the, the data from China are still early in terms of um, sort of opening things back up. Uh, so we don't have a great handle on exactly how much of a recrudescence we're going to see, but there is that concern that we might end up having sort of fits and starts of things opening and then potentially having to close if we see a large number of cases again. So that being said, I think it's pretty hard to tell you exactly what to do in the workplace because we don't know exactly what's going to happen with the virus. If we see that we can end up building enough sort of immunity within the population, then theoretically we're going to drop transmission and we're going to have to be less strict about our community practices. But if we don't end up doing that and there's still this widespread potential for transmission, then yes, we will need to probably put in place additional stricter measures of the size of group meetings and things like that. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Helen. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. And I, I imagine that because of the kind of fear and anxiety that this virus has caused all of us, that it's only kind of natural to think that there will be some fear and anxiety when we get back to quote normal. 
um, and that people will be hesitant. I mean, we've all learned how to behave in a different way now. We're not touching each other. I mean, it's a very different life. So I think it's very reasonable to expect that it's going to take us some time to get back to anything um, like what we would say was normal. Um, quick question on which cleaning products are most effective for surface decontamination. Everything works. Soap and water, your usual kitchen cleaner. Um, if you want to make your own, it's a very um, delete, very dilute bleach. It does not need to be strong, and it certainly does not need to be, um, you know, corrosive. Um, this virus is, is easily cleaned with regular soap and water on our hands, on our surfaces, and on our laundry. But, but uh, just to add, please don't believe that you can make your own hand sanitizer with uh, vodka and aloe vera. Uh, we need to have at least six <laughs> alcohol. I know it's out of the internet. Yep, good point. Tito's does not work. Um, excellent, Manos. So I, I thought we would just close. Uh, there were a couple of comments here from people who want to help, which is really, really gratifying. So many small companies, including startups, are eager to help but don't have funding to do it. Is there a place where grant opportunities are being aggregated that the startup community can access? Could MassBio take the lead on that? Um, I'll just sort of uh, speak for us in academia to thank MassBio for the leadership that you've shown and see if Bob might want to address that uh, question before we close. Panelists, but on behalf of MassBio, we can definitely look into aggregating that type of information as we would love to be able to help all of the volunteers and the companies that are looking to help. So check back in on our website and we'll see what we can do. Great. Thank you so much. So panelists, um, any closing comments you'd like to share? Manos, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Helen. Uh, just, just to say that um, we will get through this. We will get through this. Uh, this is uh, not the first and unfortunately probably not the last uh, epidemic on a global scale. Uh, and, and we have the tools, we have the science, we have the people, and we have the commitment. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that we will come out of this stronger, uh, better prepared for the next one, and, uh, and better educated as well. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm in admiration for, uh, of the commitment that everyone is showing uh, right now. Uh, and um, um, I thank you all for taking the time to, uh, uh, to listen through, the, through this panel. Uh, Natasha? Sure. So um, I also want to sort of thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here and to thank you all for listening, because I think that you have a role to play, both in terms of sort of being part of the public that's affected by this. And the more you understand about transmission, the better able we can communicate that to other people. But I think in terms of being scientists, you have a unique role to play, and we really need you to sort of step up to help answer some of these questions that are going to continue to plague us. And whether that's in diagnostics or vaccine development or therapeutics, we sort of encourage that um, that your role in that. Um, but I would just sort of in the short term say also something to consider is the role that you can play in your lab and play in terms of that PPE donation that I think MassBio is helping to organize as well as sort of reagent donation to hospitals and um, yeah. Great, thanks. And Chris? Um, I would say that people need to, for right now, stay home, be vigilant and be prepared. Um, it's not going to go away anytime soon. We're three weeks behind Europe, and I think the worst is yet to come. Um, I don't mean to be a pessimistic, but uh, you just have to be realistic about it. I am hopeful that people will step up to the plate, and especially when it comes to funding, both from the private sector and from the government. The United States government is the largest funder of these types of programs. In fact, if you look at the entire world budget for infectious diseases, a large uh, part of that comes from uh, BARDA and the NIH and Health and Human Services overall. So um, I know more programs are available. I will share a link that I received yesterday to uh, multiple government sources for funding. Um, BARDA has made their drive applications a lot easier for folks, and they're being reviewed in a timely manner, hopefully within a couple of weeks. And um, I, I do hope that the private investment community will also step up to the plate and make funding available without a lot of red tape 
so that we can come up with solutions faster and be better prepared for the future. Um, but I am overall optimistic that if people stay home, um, this, this will be able to ride this out. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. And, and I'll just end by thanking all of our excellent panelists and uh, thanking MassBio for the opportunity and the incredible work you're doing uh, to help support us through this epidemic. And I'll just offer that I really hope that this experience um, you know, teaches all of us and, and impacts change on the need for continued pandemic preparedness. You know, we need to be prepared for the next COVID-19 and the next influenza and the, all the other things that are going to come our way and uh, invest both at a public and a private way so that we're fully prepared. Um, I apologize if we didn't get to your questions. We got to as many as we could. Um, and thank you again. I hope this was useful. And thanks again to MassBio. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks.